Thanks for joining us today, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Hogan, and I am the Vice President of Accessibility and Technology for Google's uh, Disability Alliance. And I'm also the Principal Innovation Strategist for Google Cloud. Uh, I am here with, uh, with my friend and collaborator, uh, Dr. Lutza Ireland, who is broadcasting live from Brisbane, Australia, or Brisbane, as the Islanders call it. Uh, Dr. Lutza is a psychologist and design researcher. Uh, she's passionate about improving mental health literacy, uh, the skills and knowledge of managing mental health in self and others. As a mental health professional, she's worked with individuals, couples, groups, and organizations. As a designer, she submitted her doctoral research on developing a conceptual, a conceptual framework and visual language for communicating mental health information to increase mental health literacy. She uses design thinking and co-design methods to develop innovative resources, services, and systems for mental health and well-being. Uh, Dr. Lutz is also a uh, award-winning uh, uh, program developer and, and actually created uh, a thing that I stole her name called All Kinds of Minds that she won an award for. So, uh, so Dr. Lutz, I have a question for you. Uh, what does it mean to be a social designer? Great question. Um, social designers use design methods such as design thinking and co-design to conceptualize and try to solve and untease social problems um, or social issues that would benefit from some more hands on deck to be able to improve people's lives. So cool. So now I know that you and I have talked about this a lot and the title the title of our show today has everything to do with neurodiversity uh, and, and how to love, live, and, and work better uh, by understanding neurodiversity. So uh, would it be okay with you if I gave my definition of neurodiversity and, and see uh, see how that, how that resonates with you? Please do. And so the way that I describe neurodiversity is I start by describing what diversity is. So imagine... Uh, that I'm looking out at a giant amphitheater, and in that amphitheater is the entire population of Earth. So it's a really big place. And what I see are physical distinctions. I see uh, people that were born with blue eyes like me. I see different hair colors, uh, skin tones. And, and like, uh, you know, all of those differences are beautiful. And that is what is called diversity. Uh, but what I can see is how somebody interprets the world around them and how their brain works. And as you can imagine, where well, there's so many different physical distinctions, there's also a lot of different ways to perceive the world. Uh, and those are basically what we call neurodiversity. Uh, so like diversity is everyone, neurodiversity is everyone. And for me, I was born uh, physically distinct with blue eyes and uh, like somebody else I know. and. I was also born autistic, which is a neurological distinction. So, so I identify as a blue-eyed, uh, neurodistinct individual. So, I don't know how I did, but uh, but you're you're a professional, Dr. Lutz. So you tell me. No, you're absolutely a professional too, with lived experience as well, which is always very important. And what I really like about your definition is that it's able to grasp diversity both in its visible and invisible form. And I think what, what gets really interesting with neurodiversity is that we are essentially talking about differences with the nervous system, but a lot of people may not know what the nervous system actually does for us, which is where it gets very interesting for mental health, bonding, and just generally well-being for humans. And, you know, I do have a question to add on because it's in the title of our program today, but, but, but how does, how does, uh, how is love um, connected to neurodiversity? I think that love is actually the story of neurodiversity because love can be both an emotion and an action as well. So it can be a warm and fuzzy feeling that we get, or it can be passion and so on. But it can also be what we do when we love each other, love someone, love a thing, love our work, and so on. So basically, with love, the function of love 
is to improve the quality of life through encouraging people to care for each other mutually. And that would result in resource sharing and bonding in a way that enables us to be stronger together. So really, if you think about it, during evolution, when we have different um, tribes, different roles in tribes, for survival, it was absolutely essential that different skill sets evolve. And when you think about different skill sets, our nervous system and our um, hardware, so to say, our physical body needs to evolve in a way that enables different skill sets. So it's really um, a design trade-off that if you pack more in in certain areas, then some of the other areas may um, need to be um, taken away or modified because, I mean, humans really didn't really get a hardware upgrade for over a million years. So one of the ways of um, thinking about neurodiversity and love is um, to think about what actually love and emotions are in general. And one of the theories I have is around multiplicity in bodies. So it's still thinking about us as an embodied being with lived experience, but lived experience is so tricky. Um, it takes quite a while to wrap our heads around all the different facets of it. So one of the things I like to do is um, imagining as though we have three bodies. Um, this is a metaphor for looking at the body from three different perspectives. So if we have the physical body, imagine that this um, drawing is the nervous system um, and the brain over there. So this is your hardware. And you were also talking about distinctions with the social body, which is really our ways of providing an interface to others. So this is the part of us that others can see. Blue eyes, smiling, no smiling, body language, voice tone, and our behavior in general. And what else is also there is also quite an invisible aspect which is our inner body. So this is our thoughts, feelings, urges, experiences that are also invisible. And, and this is like our software, basically. So basically, when we talk about neurodiversity, we are talking about the differences in our factory settings that enables us to function in many different ways. And so, and I, and I am, I am, uh, I am starting to get this. I am not a, uh, I'm not a, a good drawer or or um, understander of the of the uh, things. But I, I am, uh, I am a, a neurodistinct human who loves to understand myself better because I'm just my own my own puzzle, I guess. So your own Rubik's cube. That's right. Very important. So really when we talk about love and neurodiversity, we can, we can think about what can neurodiversity enable us to do? Because at the moment, often when we talk about neurodiversity or neurodistinct people, we can get very stuck on talking about disabilities, um, superpower, disability inclusion, and, and so on. But neurodiversity is so much more than disability and disability inclusion it is literally everyone so if we say that diversity is variety then we can really uni universalize diversity and say that everybody is different and these differences are not only okay and something to be aware of and accept but these differences are actually something to celebrate because these are the differences that enable us to love in a way of propelling us to share resources, innovate, and bond to each other to move forward as species. And hopefully um, as a universe as well, because let's not forget that we actually live um, on the earth, which, um, which is quite dependent on what we do as well. 
and it's so true because we we've been uh, you know we the the activists around neurodiversity and making people understand that better uh, you know especially internally here at Google is we've been you know working to have these programs and and other things and have the the content and the the things we're making to to educate folks uh, to have that included in 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 a and what I would call a and just a, a standard DEI um, categorization, as opposed to being off to the side in some sort of, you know, disability program. Um, and so, you know, we've been working very hard to make sure that you know, definitions of neurodiversity show up on our diversity internal site and things like that. So, uh, you know, those are those are all big wins for for everybody. So people often ask me what makes it different to what what makes it so difficult to experience and express love because um, if we say that neurodiversity can be a story of love, then why don't we feel warm and fuzzy all the time? And I think so much can get lost in translation that when we talk about neurosmart upgrades to how we see ourselves and the world, one of the first things would be is to do an upgrade on the fact that if we are all so different, that also means that we express and experience love in many different ways. Have you had any experiences when um, you loved something, someone, and um, it was difficult to express or things were misunderstood? Yeah, I mean, all the time. I mean, my my biggest challenge is is uh, is the social side of the of, of things. And so I also have the, you know, not only being misconstrued or not saying something when I should, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, my my, you know, I'm trying to just understand myself better and, and what all that means. And, you know, I try to separate the things between, you know, what is love? One of those things that I that I go deep on to try to understand, you know, what is this? And because it's a it's not only an act, but it's a human emotion. It's a I love my job, you know, I love this project, you know. So and when you start to think about what that means, it's it's really it really translates back to me to being that, you know, that psychological safety, you know, psychological safety between two people, psychological safety between a group dynamic. So um and you know, then that's what I've I've learned. And you know, over the since since uh, since you and I have been spending time together, I've learned learned a lot from you as well. So I I'm just trying to do do my education justice here. So, but I think education is is also cool design in a sense that we are all learning from each other. And it's so important that you mentioned psychological safety because. This is one of the things that um, that can be such a hot topic at organizations and, and relationships as well. And one thing I think is very important to understand is when we talk about psychological safety, it's, it's like talking about road safety. So if we say that we made a commitment to go on a journey together, whether it's work or personal life, then just like sitting in a car, psychological safety is like a safety belt. It doesn't guarantee that there won't be any accidents or mishaps. It's a guarantee to say, we're going to try our best to protect you from seriously getting injured. Ideally, of course, not getting injured at all. But it's, um, it's quite pivotal to know that if we think that psychological safety, safety is the absence of getting hurt or um, getting sometimes maybe even offended or not getting misunderstood, then we take away the opportunity to make mistakes. And what it means is we take away the opportunity to progress because life can be so complicated, communication can be so complicated that misunderstandings and occasionally um, getting offended, getting things wrong, getting hurt is actually a natural part of life um, as long as we are also able to repair relationships, apologize when needed, and then figure out a better way to move forward together. 
right? And it's like that psychological psychological safety goes to when you do say the wrong thing that that there's a two way, uh, not an overreaction on the other side. Sometimes that happens, and so and that's why when we when we talk about this bonding, you know, the best way we can come up with it is is using the term love, just because it's such a broad, um, but 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 also very precise term uh, to talk about that. And when you actually feel comfortable, uh, you know, not only with yourself, but you feel comfortable with with an individual, or you feel comfortable with a group of individuals, um, and that uh, and that's what really starts to, you know, make the the social dynamic and even the work environment uh, and in our lives in general. Uh, much better. So if you're wondering why it's called uh, uh, how to love, live and work better, um, now you now you're starting to get the picture. So that's right. I, I think that love in this sense is really the underpinning of um, basically what motivates people. So we will always, always be stronger together with a group than what we are as individuals. So when we talk about reciprocity, working together and and so on, that work together is really just working to have a better life for all of us. So work and life, um, as much as you can supposedly separate it, um, it's really what we do, but love and how we do it is ideally a reason. So love at work might be called inclusion, acceptance, um, belonging, and and so on. And in personal life, it can be romantic love, love between friends, parenting, and really there are multiple facets. People can absolutely love animals, causes as well. So when we start to look for it, there is actually a lot of love in our lives. And it's so true. And when you start to connect that to, to the, the terms we use in, in a, you know, like belonging and, you know, and, and belonging is, is like love is, is very elusive. I mean, sometimes it's very difficult to find. And, and that's why when I talk about having found belonging, I, I often make that clarification that, that it's, it's elusive to some, and that's why I help, you know, people understand what that means. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to be to be here with you so we can do that so thank you and i was thinking um when we talk about love or really any emotions there are three different um three, three different functions purposes for having emotions so for example for love um it's signal to self it lets us know when we love something that this is important this is going to be worth the investment. It's going to be worth the commitment that we're going to make. Um, it's also to influence others. So when we feel an emotion, usually our expressions are hardwired, which is, of course, where things can get very tricky. So if you think back at, um, at the three bodies, generally what happens is we have our nervous system and in our biology so that biology will then influence a lot around um, how we express things so if we feel love um, even hurt any any type of emotion we have our biology which will react to an event so this can happen that something happens you may see for example a loved one and often our biology just lights up and what happens in our biology that is what we translate as feelings so feelings are literally the feeling of chemical changes in our bodies it's how we make sense of um of our chemical changes so when we have that in our inner body that also comes with a reaction that others can see so that might be that we start smiling wildly, um, gesturing. But what's really interesting with neurodiversity is that the social body that others can see can be actually very differently wired because of our biology. So it could be that someone is very loving and happy to see another person 
but if they have, for example, quite flat facial expressions, then that also means that they may not express it in what we usually think is the traditional way of love, which is wide smiles and um, blushing and getting really physically um, high pitched. It might be that someone is very much loving and enthusiastic and passionate about something, and they can present quite flat um, and monotone, which of course to the other people who only see the interface because everything else is invisible, that might make the individual appear bored or they don't care. Um, and I think a lot of, a lot of misunderstandings happen with that. And we talk about that a lot, like my lack of affect and something that I have to really, you know, overcompensate uh, for sometimes because sometimes I'm not, my facial expression just isn't, uh, isn't expressing how I feel. So, I mean, I even like, I don't even, I don't even smile when I finish this Rubik's Cube. So, um, you know, basically, you know, it, it's, uh, it's nice to hear the, um, you know, the three body approach to explain that, that sometimes that there's a lack of affect and and why we should be understanding around there. So. Yeah, so expressions basically usually motivate others to learn something or feel something themselves as well. So if, um, if you have what others experience as a loving expression, the influence on them is to reciprocate, ideally. So that moves them into a loving um, experience as well. So when we don't understand how someone experiences or expresses their love, passion, and so on, um, we can really miss opportunities for bonding. Um, and of course, what it means as well is that we miss opportunities to generate love because emotions are often self-generating. So the more you feel, the more you express it, will then influence and prompt others to do and feel something in relation to that. And of course, the third, um, the third function of emotions is to motivate action. So for love, it can be, um, for example, to, um, to make a commitment, to invest into something, to provide care, um, to do something that improves lives in general. And so, so intuitive. I think these are these are actually very difficult to to decipher. Um, but if we think about emotions as um, having three main purposes, I think it gets a lot easier to conceptualize even what we often call negative um, emotions. So, with motivating action here is. Um, is for example for love it's um, investment and care but if we think about love then i think we also need to think about hurt as well because they they kind of go hand in hand and the reason for that is hurt and all the other emotions that might be unpleasant they are not actually bad emotions they just feel unpleasant but they also have um, a purpose. So if we think about what hurt might be, what do you think it might signal to self? I put you on the spot with this, sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, you know, I believe that hurt probably um, will, will, will come from that, that lack of reciprocation you know of an expression um you know and it's and it's not just in a romantic relationship or any family relationship but in even in the workplace uh people will actually feel hurt when uh their ideas are not being expressed and or when their ideas are not being listened to or or they don't feel like they have an inclusion of thought so and and hurt is is kind of like you know what, what i call that that a little bit of a kill joy moment where you know, you're you're expecting to, to all of a sudden feel uh, worthwhile, and then and then that doesn't happen, so it doesn't get delivered on. So, uh, but uh, but hopefully I answered that right. I'm I'm or or, or or you know, 
in in the in the right way, I should say. I, I honestly think that there are no hard and fast answers. It's it's all about just having a different mindset in thinking, what is this emotion trying to communicate to me? And and hurt is often, as you say, it's things not going well. Um, so if we think about things not going well, um, what what might that motivate for an action? Ideal case scenario. And and what would what would uh, motivate motivate an action? Mm, what what action would it motivate? So if things are not going well, what action might be something that um, that can be useful to say? Okay, this is not going well. What can I do? Um, I believe that that you know when when something isn't going well, that's when you stop to to ask questions for clarification. You know, and, and why isn't this going well? Because the way that I'm reading something, it should be going well. But uh, but now I'm going to stop and 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 basically kind of go back and and you know ask those those questions that are going to going to try to get to the bottom of it. So it's uh and you know the the issue with all that for somebody who's neurodistinct is that this is the you know part of that of that social construct where there's you know instead of me just saying okay i feel i feel like this isn't going well and i'm just going to go over here and, and sit in the corner uh you know people who are very good at, at interacting will will just jump in and get to the bottom of it um and, and try to move that you know that situation in a different direction mm, that's right I, I think it's it's such a good point that um if you if you have um, an unpleasant emotion, it means that things are not going well. So the action it would ideally prompt is problem solving. So you try to you try to work it out. You try to figure it out. But of course, um, that can be quite quite difficult in itself as well. Because talking about neurodistinct people, one of the things that um, that can be a different wiring. And this is actually true for neurotypical and neurodistinct people, meaning um, people with all kinds of wiring, is that often in our biology, we have what we call our sensory system. And people often um, think about our senses in terms of sm sight, smell, vision, um, hearing, and touch but we actually have three additional senses which are proprioception this is our body's um, sense of movement and how much force to exert and we also have a sense of balance and the eighth one which is super important is um is interoception so interoception is basically our our body's ability to sense physical changes and physical changes are what we call feelings. So feelings are basically um, different energies in motion. Emotion is literally energy in motion in that sense. So if someone has um, interoceptive difficulties, that means that they find it difficult to translate the body feelings into the experience of emotion and that can be because they may under experience different physical signs so when people feel love excitement joy which are all um, quite connected to love usually the feelings are elevated heart rate um, it can be um, some warmth around the chest and that can be something that people can quite easily miss or even misread. So these can be often signs of anxiety, for instance. So if someone has had life experiences where their environment was so stressful, I'm putting these bodies into an environment because an environment, when we grow up um, and basically every, every minute of our existence, we can't take ourselves out of the environment. So if somebody, for example, grew up in a way um, that they had to feel anxiety a lot more than love, because 
that's what they receive from the environment, then their thinking and experiencing is probably very geared towards feelings that could mean anxiety, automatically mean anxiety, rather than our brains um, differentiating between different feelings and saying, I'm having heart palpitations. Is it love? Is it excitement? Is it joy? Or is it anxiety? Or is it all of all of the above at the same time? That can happen. <laughs> of course. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think this, this, is, and this is such a great point because love and hurt, is, it's really a different side of the same coin. So if we feel love, then the likelihood is that we are going to get hurt at some time. So it would be pretty normal to feel anxiety at the same time. And it's often when we're in a situation that we're we're going through and maybe we have this immersive belonging and we feel like, you know, I've achieved everything at the workplace that I need. And then and then something happens where, you know, maybe you do say the wrong thing or maybe somebody missed, you know, you're trying to contribute and, and maybe your idea isn't being heard. And it seems like the deeper you get into that, uh, you know, the side where where you have, you know, a deep state of, of belonging or, or a deep state of, of you know, what could, what could be described, you know, work love, um, you know, the hurt, you know, comes harder and it's almost harder to recover from. It's like when you, mm. and then the other side of the coin is like when you, when you complete a task and you know, you've done a good job and you start to get that, that tingling, you know, that hair standing on edge and, and goosebump type feeling, uh, you know, and, and it's, it, it basically, you know, almost reflects, it's like a self love, you know, uh, is how I perceive it. Like, you know, good job, you know, and, and one of the things about neurodistinct individuals is we don't celebrate uh, our success as well. We just kind of move along and it's like a very middle of the road. And, and, and that's why it's so very important for, for people to, uh, to celebrate all their, all their little victories along the way. So, and why I, I solve this Rubik's cube like 75 times a day, because I know that I'm going to get to the solution and it's going to be it's going to release that dopamine and I'm going to feel great. And I love my Rubik's cube, even though it's a, it's a Rubik's cube. So. Yeah, but it's honestly, it's, it's really legitimate to love things. Um, and it's, it's one of my pet hates actually, when um, people get very judgy about what we love and, and how we love. Um, top of my pet hates list is um, things like you can't, love dogs as much as you can love another human um i'm pretty sure you can i mean when my dogs were still alive um i definitely love them more than quite a few humans in comparison <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> but, i have uh, i have two lovely lovely tiny um fur babies that that are that are uh, very loved so and uh and and i and i totally know where you're feeling so and it and I have these strange, uh, strange emotional connections to things. Like I told you about the time that for some reason, like when I watch something about animals, I get very upset if anything bad happens to an animal for no reason what I don't know why. Um, but I, I was on a flight one time and March of the Penguins came on. I'm just listening to Morgan Freeman's soothing voice. And then all of a sudden, you know, something goes terribly wrong. And I'm, I'm literally like, bawling on the plane like a baby and the flight attendants like i'm like totally incons inconsolable at the time and uh and it was embarrassing but it but i had like this this emotional reaction that i wasn't expecting and and so and and spent a lot of time trying to figure out why that is but that's just a perfect example of how emotions can just uh you know be unexpected and, and make a turn so definitely but Another very interesting aspect of, um, of what you just said is um, if we think about evolution and the advantage of having different wiring, then it also makes perfect sense that some people's wiring was evolved to care about non-human things um, in a very visceral, very physical ways because that makes someone a specialist in something. So if you imagine, um, especially when it comes to animals, um, the weather system, anything to do with the environment, um, when we were still hunters, gatherers, 
it was extremely important for people to be able to read um, how the environment changes because they could then alert the whole tribe into what's something that's a potential foreseeable danger because at, at those times of course we were all fighting against the elements but again talking about um, design trade-offs here if somebody has the ability to get involved with the environment and understand and be able to read systems then the ability for social bonding is really not super important because they are able to provide something that no one else can. So their role in the tribe is to provide love through being able to foresee things or understand things in a way that are essentially very helpful for, for the tribe. So people who may not be um, that involved with social expressions and small talk and so on, um, they may show their love for togetherness through being able to be involved with systems and focusing on tasks more so than um, chit chat. And it's so true. So, so I'm progressing through our notes, and I'm going to see where we where we are, and uh, we're about probably eight minutes away from our exercise, and then we're going to have a Q and A. So. Um, but I'm gonna. I know I'm missing some some wonderful, wonderful, uh, deep, penetrating questions here. So, and so let let me just ask this question. So, if this is all about love, you know, why don't we feel great all the time? Um, part of the reason is um, because love and hurt do go hand in hand, and when we don't know how we express love, we like to receive love <clears throat> and how people are actually feeling because often the way we express love, we assume that it's the same for other people as well. So if it's not how we receive it, um, then we may get very disappointed um, and that goes into hurt. And again, we can use hurt to our advantage as well because if we use it as a signal, we say, but something is not going well, I'm feeling hurt. Ideally, if we are able to express that hurt, then that would influence others to support us and provide care and help us to problem solve, for instance, or repair relationships. And it can, of course, um, motivate actions to, to problem solving. So one of the things that happens with love or when we are working together on something, when we live with someone and, um, and we feel hurt or feel the absence of love is we may withdraw. So instead of expressing what's going on, um, we may tend to just turn into ourselves um, and that can cause a distance in the relationship that makes it very difficult for love and hurt to do what they are supposed to do because they are not expressed in a way that others are able to receive it. Or in some instances, um, people may um, act and express um, their hurt through anger. And then a lot can go, um, of course, airy, especially if that goes into aggression because that is something very different that can be um, sometimes quite harmful. And I'm talking about aggression here. If people are able to express anger and hurt in ways that are appropriate and helpful, that that can actually increase the amount of love that people have together. So when so, <laughs> you go. I said it's so insightful, and I, uh, you know, I, I am, uh, I, I'm just always blown away. So, so we're talking about, um, we're talking a lot about, about love. But how can we be better at expressing love? Great question. Um, there are generally five love languages. For those of you who are interested, you can pretty much Google five love languages. Um, 
and even do a um, um, questionnaire for yourself. So some of the ways of expressing love um, is through touch. And I'm talking about not, not just physical touch, but thinking about word. It can be physical proximity. So think about at the moment, um, and this is where diversity comes in um, as a really important factor. Some of us, me personally, are being very relieved with social distancing and not having to go um, into the office because the physical proximity of people is really not a love language um, that I need um, at, at work, for instance. So I'm quite um, happy, in fact, more than happy to be fairly far away from people. But those of us who may like touch and physical proximity, um, they tend to really miss the office and the physical togetherness with someone. And um, even with personal lives, people living in isolation can go into touch hunger where they crave touch, not, not just necessarily human touch, but any touch, um, including having an, an animal around or, or just any kind of skin contact. Um, and then another um, love language is words of affirmation. So words of affirmation is really telling someone um, that you love them. And that could be literally saying, I love you. It can be um, affirming someone's importance or worth. So that's why in a work um, relationship, KPIs and performance reviews can be so important because they can provide opportunities for feedback that can really reward people in giving more of an understanding as to how important they are and how meaningful their jobs are. Um, and if it's not being expressed, it can be really a missed opportunity. Um, and then we have quality time. So quality time in personal relationships can be literally spending time together where people are having their needs met and um, do whatever the other enjoys. Or for many neurodistinct people, that can be quite um, a parallel play. So everybody does what they enjoy, but um, they are doing it um, as, as a shared um, activity without necessarily participating in each other's um, activity as such. Okay, I need to get back to my words. Um, and then there are gifts as well. So in a work situation that can be bonus um, and in, in personal lives it can be literally buying presents for someone else. And the last one is acts of service. So acts of service is really anything that we do for a person to make their lives easier. So that can be in teams collaboration. Everybody does what they are good at to be able to propel a team forward. Um, and in personal life, it could be anything that that lightens someone someone's load. So doing things from it for each other that can show that um, there is love and mutual support. And I guess um, as, as a closing of all this, the, the way it all connects to neurodiversity and upgrading how we can live and work together um, to be more supportive and more loving and more efficient is understanding what is it like for you to, to express and experience love. So have a think about what is it like for you? How do you experience it in your biology? How do you experience it in your inner world? What are your thoughts and feelings? And then how do you express them? Um, whether it's facial expressions or um, any of these love languages that you have. And then start decoding each other and share around it so that we create a culture of sharing around how different it can be that um, we have all these really valid ways in which we can help each other and experience love. And it's also very interesting that we we look at these these the love languages, but they 
but they can also be like the opposite, which is what the hurt languages are. So almost because you're, if you're, if you're in a thing where you're expecting some sort of sense of service because your expectation is being set so high, uh, you know, even if you're walking to a scenario and you, and you've set your expectation that that somebody is going to, uh, you know, be even if it's just something as simple as being courteous or, or being kind, and and that doesn't happen, uh, you know, it it causes you know causes that 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 hurt feeling that you have. So. We probably need a whole new session just to go over the five and do the reverses. So I Definitely, it. yes. And so we talked a lot about, you know, trying to get your um, your voice being heard when you're in a when you're in a setting. And let's say you're in a, a workplace and you're on a team and you're trying to uh, make a product better or something or or what we would call innovate uh, or, or what my world I would call innovate and. And so this is when we're going to ask the ask the audience uh, to put into the chat, uh, uh, because what we're what we want to know is when somebody is actually trying to contribute to the 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 situation. Uh, sometimes there's a there's 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 words that are used that are behaviors that are used that that can come back and say like there's a there's a fine line what I'm trying to say between being annoying and being innovative. So uh, so you're and and. So sometimes people will throw throw out uh, you know ideas or thoughts that that are doing. So what we were going to ask for, uh, and you don't have to name anybody's name, but if you're listening and you can put it into the chat, uh, what would you describe as as an annoying behavior um, when you're when you're working on a team? And Dr. So Lutz, basically, like that, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We we basically work on this. Um, strength-based approach to think about how can we reframe um, annoying behaviors as innovative behaviors. So I think um, because as we were talking about it, love and innovation doesn't make us feel warm and fuzzy all the time. And a lot of it is because um, things get lost in translation. So we are trying to reframe so-called annoying qualities to see if we look at it from a strength-based perspective, then what can come out of it as an innovation potential. So are you annoying or are you innovating? And we would like to really see some um, qualities that you may have been told or um, it might be a bit of a pain point for you in others. So we can turn it around and see how we can use that as a potential to innovate right and we and we have something coming hopefully these aren't comments about my my uh my talking style but i did i did get the talking too long and not actually saying much of value so um that was just a joke by the way i'm a joke maker so uh and so basically uh you know what we're what we're going to do and then also we have uh not internalizing what was said from jennifer Right. Um, so, for example, talking too much. Um, talking too much is something that is um, often um, a function of um, people being verbal processors. So that might be someone who is a verbal processor and they may have very strong language skills, but they may also have needs um that um that makes them a social learner so they really have to talk things through in order to understand it so what i would say is that if someone is talking too much then it would be important to tap into their verbal processing capacity because they might be an incredible storyteller or they might be really charismatic but one thing to do there as an element for support is to provide different, more appropriate spaces where they can talk things through or enable them to be able to verbalize things on their own, whether it's journaling, note-taking, or um, something that gives them verbal real estate so they can get their thoughts out and then be more concise um, once it comes to contributions um, during teams. I probably could have said that more economically with words, but I'm a verbal processor as well. 
And then, sorry, I forgot the, the second one would be internalizing or not internalizing. Yeah. The second one was just not internalizing what was safe, said from, from Jennifer. And, uh, you know, very important um, because sometimes people will, you know, be in those in those situations. But, you know, um, you know, where where you're where you actually hear something and then and then, you know, now I'm going to I'm going to try to just I think that's actually something about me when it's when some usually the case isn't. But uh, but what do you think, Dr. Lutza? Mm. It's it's a really tricky one without knowing the context because not internalizing can be that um, something is discussed and um, things are not um, taken on board, or it can be um, sometimes not internalizing is basically not taking responsibility for something um, that we should be taking responsibility for. So I think if it's not internalizing in a sense of um, not being able to move forward, um, then that can be a sign of being really persistent. And when we have someone who is really persistent, um, they may persist on things that are not necessarily useful, but persistence can be a really important quality for innovation. And Jim, as an innovation specialist, why is persistence important for innovation? Well, sometimes it's, uh, you know, when we talk about persistence, so sometimes an idea gets thrown out multiple times before it sticks. And so, um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's very, it's very important to, uh, to hold, hold true to, to what you believe is, is the way it is. Um, because sometimes after somebody has said something in a group discussion, what you said 15 minutes ago has way more value. And so sometimes people will say it again. So, uh, usually the, you know, some, one of the, one of my defects is I'm usually the first person in the room to, to understand what the answer is. And, and it's about keeping my mouth shut and letting everybody talk before um, before I do that. So because I don't want to be overbearing. And it's like uh, that's like what Nick just put into the chat. He said finding the hard balance between being respectful and paying attention and trying to be efficient when meetings are are long and irrelevant. So because a lot of people just want to cut to the chase, right? So um, and and it's uh and it's a it's a really good really good comment. So. Definitely. And, and, and you are talking about diversity there so much because persistence is also important in um, not giving up. So it's, it's also around um, wait, being able to wait things out because it's really good if we have a mixture of people who are high risk takers, quite impulsive, quite action orientated. But it's also important to balance it out with persistence and cautiousness. Um, because that balance is what can create um, sustainability. I'm getting a lot of lot of private comments that, that everybody wants you to come back. So um, basically, I'm going to move on to Q&A because we have to, because we're going to run out of time. So um, I'm going to bring up the the first question is is uh, is Nick's question that he asked early on. Um, it's hard to know the pieces of a mind that might be missing or different relative to a typical person. How does a person figure those out? I'm trying to think about um, understanding this um, this question. Um, what I what I understand from this question is um, it may be referring to some of the different ways of processing for neurodistinct people compared to a neurotypical person. I don't actually think that there are any pieces missing. I think that people can be really complete as they are if the environment um, offers the type of support that enables everyone to live according to their best self. So this is not to say that um, we are amazing as they are and we shouldn't strive to, to be better um, at things. It's quite the opposite. It is just to say that we are not supposed to be good at everything. We, we're just really not. And that is why we have different factory settings because there is no one human who can be great at everything. 
And the reason why it's um, really not something to strive for as well is because we have different roles and different values that we can we can bring to the table. So instead of thinking, what are the things that we are not so good at? Let's think about what are the things that we are good at? What are the things that we can contribute? And let's look at each other with that lens as well. What, what are the good things about this person? What can we achieve together? And I have our next one is not a, it's more of a comment, but, uh, but it comes from, uh, from somebody we both know. So let's, let's take a look at that one. Uh, it's from, uh, from Tim and he says, uh, what a cool, super cool drawing tablet you have. So, so in, in, <laughs> thank you, Tim. As some of you, some of you may know, Tim and I, uh, you know, Tim is my vocal coach. So if I'm doing terrible with my voice, you have to call Tim, uh, and Tim actually introduced me to Dr. Lutza, so um, a long time ago. But now, and also, I want to I want to move to the to the comment, uh, the Nicholas on comment at two fourteen. Um, it's it's more of a comment, but I wanted to I wanted to cover this um, because, you know, he identifies as an autistic extrovert. So as an autistic extrovert, it's really easy to be misunderstood and there's nothing quite like a psychologically safe workplace for me especially one in which people are willing to understand this and because it's not just about uh people actually being keeping to themselves uh as a trait of being autistic you know i'm the same way like i'm i'm usually when you get me in a social setting i'm kind of a social butterfly although i have a little bit of anxiety around it but um but I don't know if you've if you've encountered the uh, the autistic extrovert, Dr. Lutza. Definitely, but I think um, as far as um, as psychological safety goes or misunderstandings go, it's very useful to to really highlight specifics um, and talk about autism. We do like to highlight specifics quite a bit, but in any case, if we want to really take advantage of neurodiversity, then a culture of sharing needs to be very specific to what are the things that need to be supported and what are the things that are going well. Because if we say um, blanket statements like I'm autistic or um, I've got a booga booga disease, basically there are so many different ways of being, not to say that autism is a disease, just to um, get that out in the clear, but we have so many different ways of being that the blanket statements that provide labels, unless somebody knows them and are intimately familiar with them, um, it's not necessarily helping the environment to understand what it is that we need and what it is that, that we are good at. So sometimes instead of um, sharing being autistic and leaving it at that and letting people to figure out what it needs, uh, what it means, it can be very useful to say, um, I, um, I really um, can help you with X, Y, Z, my strengths are whatever they are, um, and what I need support with is, and then fill in the blanks. So have that user guide that really operationalizes what people can do and how they can read you um, so that we don't leave some so much wiggle room. But I know we are short on time. I just really want to um, really want to emphasize um, an example of love and innovation, for example, um, is, is actually Tim Goldstein, because um, many of you may not know that Tim is the person who um, created the word neurodistinct. And I think that's an excellent example of innovation through thinking about um, how can we make neurodiversity more friendly, more digestible, so that um, it doesn't sound like a disease, it actually sounds something positive that people can associate with. So that um, is quite an expression of care and being able to move, th move things forward from there. And that is just one of the things that we love Tim so much for. 
And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, that's our hour. So, and thank you for the comments about, about having her back because we have all kinds of subjects to talk about. So, uh, and, uh, but thank you for being with us, Dr. Lutz. Appreciate it so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.